Uh, my name is Dan McCannon. I am the Emerson Senior Lecturer here at the Divinity School, and I've had the great pleasure of leading our planning team for this conference. I also bring warm greetings this morning from Dean David Hempton, uh, the Dean of the Divinity School, who will be here in person uh, to give a greeting to all of you tomorrow morning at this time. I want to thank Rachel Schneider, Stefan Schneider, and Robert Karp uh, for planting the initial seed for this conference in my mind. Uh, when they talked to me about the ways the Biodynamic Association was reaching out to farmers and spiritual leaders from a variety of spiritual traditions, I thought perhaps that dialogue could be extended to include academic scholars of religion as well. So that's what I think we've achieved here, uh, a rich community of farmers, scholars, activists, and spiritual leaders from more traditions than any of us could have imagined at the beginning. I invite you over these two days to take full advantage of the diversity of the community we have gathered. Please try to attend at least one session that reflects the work of a spiritual community with which you are not yet familiar. If you're a student or a professor, please go to at least one session led by a farmer. And if you're a farmer, please go to at least one session led by a student or a professor. If you encounter ideas or practices that you find strange or even incomprehensible, ask a question. If you're talking about practices that others might find strange, invite questions. Get to know one another and try to imagine some of the things that might be possible in our working together. The level of interest that we've seen for this conference suggests that we may be being called to do something new and transformative uh, as we look towards the future. To start that conversation about what the future might hold, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Nigel Savage, the founder and CEO of Chazan. Nigel is, among many other accomplishments, the first English Jew that we know of to have cycled across South Dakota on a recumbent bike. <laughs> that is a great way to learn about agriculture. <laughs> Nigel has been a historian, a fund manager, and briefly a movie star. And for the past 16 years, he has been building Chazan into one of the most <laughs> inspiring faith-based environmental movements in the world. Hazan works to create healthier and more sustainable Jewish community through capacity building, thought leadership, and transformative outdoor experiences, especially experiences of farming at the Isabel Friedman Center and newer farms popping up around the country. Nigel will be speaking this morning on Jewish tradition and contemporary life, lessons from the evolution of the Jofi movement. Nigel. Um, Dan, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, and thank you for uh, imagining and uh, creating this event and bringing all of us here this morning. Um, I'm genuinely incredibly excited and honored to be here. Um, despite the fact that I actually have a lot that I want to say, I hate the thought of speaking directly to a group of people before they have had a chance to hear their own voice. So even briefly, I just want to say, turn to your neighbor and take one minute to introduce yourself and where you're from, and just one reason that you're interested or excited to be here today, and we'll come back in one minute. <laughs> and that's your one minute. Shh. Come back together. Shh. Shh. Finish your sentence. Shh. Come back. Um, and I think I'd just like to hear from three or four people. You just get to say your name and where you're from and one reason you're interested to come to this conference. Yeah. Um, I'm Allie, and I'm from this area, and I work with Jewish uh, summer camp and summer arms specialists. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Gideon Zahal. I'm from India. I'm, I'm in the Green School. So I also work the sustainable Thank you. And there was somebody over here, yeah. I'm Nuria, and I'm here to this conference because my Savage is a speaker and as a Christian minister, I'm super inspired by the work that you've done. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm Lincoln Geiger, the dairy farmer from New Hampshire. I'm incredibly excited about this spiritual and exciting of this group. 
Super, thank you. So I, I, I want to say really genuinely thank you to everybody for being here. Um, I, I, <laughs> this, is, this is not fake, it's the sort of thing that a person would say at this point, but I just want to say that I have such a deep and genuine sense of, of humility bordering on, bordering on embarrassment uh, that I'm speaking right now. And, and as I'm going to explain in a minute, there are a bunch of things um, that I and, and many people with me and around me have been working on for the last 15 years, which I'm very proud of. And at the same time, I have such a strong sense of amazing things happening around the country and around the world under the radar. Um, and, and to that extent, in being here at the start, I think that I literally represent so many people in this room who in different ways are taking forward conversations and programs and experiences that are so necessary right now. Um, what I want to do uh, this morning is to try and give a sense of some of what has been happening underneath the radar of uh, organized uh, Jewish life in this country and to some extent around the world in the last few years. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my background and the organization that I founded and run and which uh, a bunch of our partner organizations. Um, but I wanted to start off, first of all, <clears throat> by really stepping back and placing the work that we do, and to some extent this, this conference, in context. Um, I've been thinking a lot recently about the famous definition of the optimist and the pessimist. And the pessimist says, I just don't see how things could possibly get any worse. And the optimist says, oh, I think I can. <laughs> and of course, it's, it's funny, but it's also sad. Um, um, Dan, you were talking about riding across the country in 2000, um, but we rode across and saw the corn grow every day, and never once in two and a half thousand miles saw a person in a field. Um, and you think of climate change and what's happening in Flint and refugees and all of the, all of the enormous ways in which the world that we live in at the moment is being challenged. Um, and then, and that's one whole set of things. And then separately, you come on to the place of religion. And quite separately from the challenges being faced by the world at the moment, are the challenges being faced by organized religion in this country. And the extent to which, in general, across a wide, wide range of denominations, religion, religious organized religion is not speaking to people in ways that it has done in the past. And the same, of course, is true in the Jewish community. And these are typical headlines in the Jewish community about challenges into marriage, people not engaged, the shrinking Jewish middle. That last table, if you can read it, is essentially saying that Jews of no religion is a higher and higher proportion the younger that you are. And yet underneath the radar, things are changing in the Jewish community. So first of all, what do we think of when we think of Jewish people? Uh, <laughs> So there's, there's food first, and then there's the Torah, there's some rabbis. That's Heschel with Martin Luther King, uh, Sarah Silverman, um, this guy, these, uh, these people, and also this guy and this guy. Um, but this also is an image of what it is to be Jewish in the 21st century. This is the the JCC, the Jewish Community Center in Manhattan. And that's a farmer's market um, being led by farmers from Khazan's uh, Adama program. And a connection both to Jewish tradition and the physical world around us is, I think, enabling us in deep ways to take those two very different sorts of challenges in the world. The challenge of how we actually live sustainably and well, seven billion of us on this small planet, and the role that religion plays, can play, could play, should play in actually answering those questions. And essentially explaining this picture and how it arises and what these people are doing and how they get there and the range of other people like them doing stuff around the country is part of the story that I'm here to tell uh, this morning. Um, I am officially the least likely person you could, uh, could have doing this. Uh, this is me at my bar mitzvah. <laughs> Luckily, the statute of limitations has passed. Um, and, as Dan, and as Dan said, then I worked in finance and wore a suit and lived one kind of a life. Um, 
And I also got involved in, in uh, some film stuff in England. Leon the Pig Farmer is a fabulous film, which I recommend to everybody. Um, and, and, and the question is how, therefore, I get to be here and do the stuff that I'm doing. One of the things that I think, in retrospect, had a huge impact on me was reading this book, probably more than 25 years ago. It's not an academic book. It's called The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight. I haven't read it in 25 years, and in, in, in giving this talk this morning, I went and looked up this screenshot. But it's called The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight because Tom Hartman, in the period before the conversation about climate change, was saying essentially, all of the world's carbon deposits accreted over a billion years. They're organic material, right? That's where coal and oil comes from. And in this book, he essentially said, all of those things that took a billion years to arise we're going to literally burn through them in two or three or four hundred years. And I read that book and, and, and I felt so deeply, intensely, how clearly that was wrong. How clearly it couldn't possibly be the case that it was okay for us to do that. And funnily enough, as I was Googling it for this presentation, the first quote that I saw online was this line. And so we so, see people who are spiritually disconnected, living in boxes and driving in boxes. Perhaps once a year going out to nature to get a small touch of what was once the daily experience of humans. These people, which is all of us, seek escape. They and we sit in urban and suburban homes and at least sometimes feel miserable, not knowing why, experiencing anxiety and fear and pain that can't be softened by drugs or TV or therapy because what we're <laughs> afflicted with is a sickness of the soul and not of the mind. So this book had a big impact on me. And so did Reb Shlomo Kalbach. He's one of the great rabbis of the 20th, 20th century. And I had learned with him on various occasions. And he was in Jerusalem in the summer of 2000 and taught for three days. And I took 50 pages of notes over those three days. And at the end of it, agreed that I would learn with him every time that he was in Jerusalem. And the next time that he was in Jerusalem was for his funeral. And he died two months later. And I was really devastated by his death. And I went back over my notes, and there was something that he said, which I think he hadn't made a big deal out of. But as I looked at my notes, they really spoke to me. He said, the Torah is a commentary on the world, and the world is a commentary on the Torah. The Torah, meaning Jewish tradition in its totality, is a commentary on the world, meaning both the physical world, meaning all of the, other, all of the world's other spiritual traditions, and meaning, for that matter, the physical world that sustains us. And each one of those things is a commentary on Jewish tradition. And in saying the Torah is a commentary on the world, and the world is a commentary on the Torah, I felt very deeply that he was saying that these two separate conversations, these two separate aspects of our lives, can and could and should be put in relationship with each other. And there was one other impact um, that I realized I don't have a slide for here. But that was that I grew up in this sort of you saw the photograph, this sort of um, chubby, nerdy, intellectual wing of the English Jewish community. So I'd never actually ever set foot outdoors. And a friend of mine in Israel invited me on a sea to sea hike from Achziv on the Mediterranean Sea to the Sea of Galilee. And that was the first time that I'd actually been outdoors and carried a backpack and pushed myself. And I started to see that it was actually good for a person to be outdoors and to exert ourselves physically. <laughs> that it was a way to bring people together across difference that Jewish tradition came alive outdoors in a way that it didn't in a synagogue. And so bringing all of that together, I moved to New York in 2000 and kicked off Chazan with a Cross USA Jewish environmental bike ride. And we had a group of people cycle across America to raise environmental awareness in the Jewish community and stopped and taught in synagogues and churches, did press and TV. Um, we ended at the White House. We got an award from the EPA. Um, I should tell you that we had on that ride riders who were uh, ultra-Orthodox, Orthodox, conservative, reform, secular, and anti-religious, straight and gay, married and single, aged 20 to 47, and we were only 11 riders. <laughs> we, we tested pluralism to destruction all by ourselves. Um, and then we started a bike ride the following year in New York, and that's grown every year since. And we've got a very sexy video, and I don't know if we've got... I'm going to show it anyway, whatever. Um, so we did, <laughs> we did that bike ride every year and grew that. And then we started a bike ride in Israel. Um, it's an incredibly profound way 
to see Israel on a bicycle riding from Jerusalem to Elat. And we started a bike ride there to support a master's program in environmental leadership that brings together Israeli Jews, Israeli Palestinians, Palestinians, Jordanians, and Americans. And it's a really, really, really profound program. And it's an instance over there of what is happening also over here of engagement with the world actually enabling people to come together across difference, uh, so long as you miss the camels. Um, and then we started um, a CSA, uh, the first CSA in the American Jewish community, partnering a synagogue with a local organic farm. Um, and that CSA network has grown over the last few years. And then we started to develop curricular material and a food conference and our blog, The Jew and the Carrot. Um, we started a working group on the farm bill. Um, we started a series of food festivals. Um, that was our food conference in 2008. Um, it was interesting, just one aside along the way, in 2008, the larger kosher slaughterhouse in North America got closed down in Postville, Iowa for a whole series of federal infractions. In fact, at our food conference the year before, one of the things that we'd done was publicly slaughter three goats as a way to start a conversation about the nature of our meat and where it comes from. And starting that process allied with this story has separately from everything else that I'm talking about today driven a tremendous amount of change under the radar in terms of relationship to animals and meat production in the Jewish community. Um, along the way, we merged with Teva. Teva is actually the oldest continuous program in Chazan. It was founded in the late 90s. Teva is Hebrew for nature. Um, and it's an environmental education program for middle school kids who come out to our retreat center for four days. And they arrive as city kids who don't want to get their feet dirty and literally leave three days later, literally rolling around in the mud and playing with bugs and having had changes which in some senses persist in their lives. Um, that's our Jewish climate campaign and our topsy-turvy bus. And then this is Isabella Friedman. This is the retreat center that's now part of Chazan. As an institution, it's 100 years old. It was originally created in the days of the sweatshops to enable um, poor working Jewish girls in the city to go and have a week in the country. Um, and it's now the home of Adama. And Adama was founded by uh, Shamu Sadeh, who's in this uh, photograph, and our friend Adam Berman. And Adama is Adama Hebrew for earth. And, from, from, and connecting also to the word Adam, Right? The word Adam in the creation story is, in a sense, earthling, because Adam is the, is the creature that, as it were, comes from Adama. Um, and so this is the Adama program, and it's led also by Jana Silla, Silla and her family. She's going to be teaching this afternoon. Um, and Adama brings a group of Jewish 20-somethings for three months at a time to learn farming. And indeed, not just farming, but intentional community and nonviolent communication and leadership skills and ecology and permaculture and a whole series of other things. And it has been immensely, immensely powerful for its participants. Um, and so Chazan today has really grown and we've got a whole range of programs, all of which at some level are genuinely trying to create a healthier and a more sustainable Jewish community and a healthier and a more sustainable world for every, everybody. Everything that Chazan does one way or another is about pointing Jewish life outwards so that to be Jewish is necessarily to engage with some of the largest issues of our time and with the presumption that doing that will at the same time strengthen and renew Jewish life. But it turns out that it's not just Chazan, because then our friend Yakir Manella started something equivalent at the Pearlstone Center in Baltimore, and then Adam Berman did this in the East Bay in Berkeley, and then the Margulis family did it in Geneva, Illinois, and then two young women created Sharash in Toronto, and Milk and Honey Farm in Boulder, Colorado, and Coastal Roots Farm in North County, Encinitas. Um, that was, I didn't probably explain it, but this word Joffe, which I'll come to, because Jewish life was really short of acronyms. We really felt that there needed to be another one. Um, Joffe stands for Jewish Outdoor Food, Farming, and Environmental Education. Um, and that, going back to that earlier, uh, those headlines after Pew Pessimism, is Joffe the new acronym for the Jewish future? And so just some of these things. This is Pearlstone in Baltimore. That's Yakir and his wife, Nats, on the right there, who met through Adama and Teva. Um, uh, and two of their three kids, and an amazing farm there, which is both growing produce that's going to people in need and doing incredible programming in the local community. 
This is a master plan. They're in the early stages right now of redeveloping the whole site and, amongst other things, seeking to create uh, essentially intentional community co-housing on the site as well as what else is going on there. Um, this, is the, this is what was the last piece of undeveloped land in North County Encinitas and an outfit called the Leash Tag Foundation created Coastal Roots Farm there. Um, it's a really, really, really large site. On Tubish Vat this year, which is the Jewish tree day, they planted 600 trees to start to create an edible food forest there. There is stuff happening there on a really significant scale. And again, it's happening both to strengthen the Jewish community, but also absolutely directly involving all of the local communities. Um, Urban Adama in, in Berkeley, even more so. Um, it's taking the stuff that we're doing at Adama that Adam created at Adama in the country and taking it into a really mixed urban neighborhood and doing really, really, really profound things there. And there later this year, please God, going to be moving on to a new campus, which is going to be really amazing. Um, pushing the envelope in Geneva, Illinois, same thing. Um, this is a family who had, I might come back to this later, but a, an envelope factory and started to get connected to some of the different things that, that we've been doing and were part of these experiences and came back and said, we've got 11 acres of land, nothing's happening there. Let's, and it was being sort of industrially farmed. Let's start to create a working organic educational farm here. Um, KMI Zaire Israel, a slightly different story. This is a 100-year-old reformed temple in Hyde Park in Chicago. And a guy called Robert Neville there got really passionate and said, it's crazy that we've got a front lawn here just sitting here looking pretty. Let's rip it up and grow food with our neighbors to help people in need. And they did it at KM Isaiah, and they did, three or four of the local black churches got involved as well. It's a particularly amazing place to visit. That's the lawn being ripped up in the shape of a Mag and David, a Jewish star. But one of the things that's really incredible is that the reason you see that big car there and the reason that, in fact, to go there, you have to go past the huge black Secret Service SUV is that it is right opposite the Obama's house. <laughs> when the president and the first lady go home to Chicago, which they do once or twice a year, they look out their front window and see a synagogue that has ripped up its front lawn in order to grow food for people in need. Um, this is Shoresh in Toronto. This is also starting to happen on an enormous scale. Um, this, is, this is sort of outside of Toronto, um, <clears throat> but Risa and Allison, who you see in the photograph there, recently did a 200-year plan for this piece of land in terms of thinking about the evolution of it. They're in the process of planting 16,000 trees on this land as, a process of, uh, as part of a process of afforestation. This is Becca Weaver in Boulder, Colorado. And then the same things in a slightly different way happening in Israel. Kaima Farm in Israel, just, just outside of Jerusalem, um, created by a recovering lawyer called Yoni. And he actually created a working farm for teenage runaways, kids who've run away from home and dropped out of school. And it's a really amazing place, and these kids are physically working themselves in farming, and they're going to high school uh, in the evening, and they're coming out of it, many of them at the age of 18, in a lot better shape than they were when they were 15. Um, Chava Adam in Israel. And then this is really amazing, right? This is Sheol Yudelman, who you see on the left there. Right? This is in, depending on your language, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, Palestine. Um, and this is essentially um, people who are saying, look, look, I'm Jewish and I'm Palestinian. And we actually we disagree on a bunch of things, but we really, really, really genuinely care about the land and are connected to it. Let's see if it's even possible to begin to come together in relationship to land. And they started an amazing project there. Uh, one of... Um, just move on to um, just a few of the lessons and some other aspects of this. One of them is about the power of language and the power of naming things. Um, one of the things that we did was we sat in our office a little while ago and we said, something's going on here, let's give it a name. Um, and I said, let's call this the Jewish food movement. And somebody said, Nigel, that sounds like a bowel movement. And I said, <laughs> fair, fair point, let's come up with something else. But 20 minutes later, we hadn't. And if you go into Jewish food movement now in Google, you'll get 7,000 results. And just interestingly, I put in Catholic food movement, and it got eight results. And I, the, no, 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 it's, it's incredibly important for me to say why I did this, right? Lest anybody here be really confused. I want to say it because I, it, this is not in any sense, God forbid, dissing um, the Catholic Church. It's much more that, that what I actually want to say to this room of people is that feel free to take this. 
right? Somebody should actually put the phrase Catholic food movement and Christian food movement in a series of different things and start to actually use that to engage people and bring them together across difference. Um, that's also where this acronym came from, right? We, we, a group of foundations actually put money in to have two teams of external researchers start to look at all of this stuff. And we published a report in which we named it and started to demonstrate the impact of what has been happening in the Joffe movement around the country. And just the act of giving it an acronym, even though that's kind of ridiculous in one sense, has actually helped leaders in the American Jewish community start to have a shorthand tool or phrase or acronym to say, oh, this Joffe thing, like, we should, what are we doing there? We should be doing some of that. And that's ultimately, I think, good for the world. Um, and indeed, that was, uh, that was our staff gathering two days ago, somebody created that. Um, thought leadership and language is even more powerful in relationship to religious tradition. And there are many, many, many examples of this that I want to give, uh, that I could give. But the one that I'm going to give is to do with Shemitah, the sabbatical year, which happens every seven years. Um, this was the story in the New York Times at the start of the Shemitah year in 2000. Um, and essentially, every seven years, because of the minutiae of the rules of Shemitah, that ends up being chaos in Israel amongst the Orthodox and the ultra-Orthodox, who have two different interpretations of this. So this was the story about it in Israel in, two, in the New York Times in 2000. Um, this was essentially the same story in 2007. And in 2007, I read this story. Like, the names had been changed. Everything else in the story was the same about chaos, and these people couldn't agree on it. And I read this piece, and I was like, did you know that the Shemitah year was coming? Right? <laughs> which, which person gets ready for Shabbat, who's observing at 6 o'clock on a Friday afternoon? And in a much deeper sense, here is this thing. What is Shemitah about? It's in the Torah. It's in the Bible. It's about relationship to land. It's about equality and forgiving debts. It's about allowing the land to lie fallow. It's about the nature of community. These are not abstract questions that are 2,000 years old. These are questions that we're grappling with today. So in 2007, during the last Shemitah year, we said, OK, let's create a Shemitah project. And, we, and let's work over the next seven years to put Shemitah on the agenda of the Jewish community and to some extent beyond. And you can just see some of the words there. Reimagine society, renew Jewish life, re release the land, forgive debt, rethink farming. These are questions. These are not answers. That's also critical to this. Um, and we published a 130-page source book. We translated a key text from the early 20th century. And lo and behold, this time around when the Shemitah year started, the piece in the New York Times in September of 2014, and we had nothing directly to do with it. We don't have a PR person. I'm not quoted in it. I didn't know that this story was happening. <coughs> Every person who was quoted in that story in the Times, which was a very different story than it was in 2000 and 2007, had been involved in the Shemitah work that we developed over the preceding seven years. Um, this was the most amazing one of all. This was a different story in the Times two months later. This is Laurie Zoloth, who is as president of the American Academy of Religion at the AAR's annual gathering in San Diego. This is December of 2014, three months into the Shemitah year, gave her keynote address and challenged everybody and said, we're putting 10,000 people in airplanes to come here. In seven years' time, let's not do it. Like, that's our challenge. We're of every religion. We study every religion. Let's take this piece of religious tradition seriously and actually apply it in seven years' time. So I read this piece in the paper, and I don't know this woman. I've had no connection to her. And I was really interested by this. And I finally made a phone date with her. She's in Chicago. And I phoned her up, and I said, um, Tell me about that and what happened and why did you do that? She said, do you not know why I did it? And I said, no. She said, it was because of Chazan. I said, how is it because of Chazan? She said, my son was at your Shemitah summit in London in March of that year and phoned me up and said, mom, you've got to do something about this. But I, 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 the reason I give it as an example is because we all of us are involved in direct and indirect impact. And this is actually not a story about Chazan. It's not a story about the AAR or Laurie Zoloft. It's a story about the power of an idea whose time has come. 
It's a story of the Torah really is a commentary on the world, and the world really is a commentary on the Torah. And therefore, a 2,000-year-old tradition plays out differently, can, could, should play out differently in our generation. And the questions that we now need to ask help us to read the tradition freshly. Um, then there's, there is stuff that we haven't even talked about, but at some level, I don't think that we've made a huge impact in the wider world, but you can't do stuff like this without at least trying to be involved in advocacy. That thing on the right there is, a, is, a, is an amicus brief that we're hoping to file tomorrow um, with a group of religious environmental organizations on the current um, case that's going through the, the, the Court of Appeals in the DC Circuit about coal pollution and climate change rules. Um, so lessons learned. So I wanted to start off, this is, um, this is Angie Thurston and Casper to Kyle, who various people here uh, must know who are at the Div School. Um, they gave an amazing presentation at a conference uh, that we were at four, years, four, four weeks ago. And they produced this report, How We Gather. These guys got really interested in non-religious expressions of spirituality amongst contemporary American millennials. And, um, and published this report. And these were the six things that was the punchline of their report, that these new expressions of 20-something spirituality involve um, valuing and fostering deep relationships that center on service to, to others, personal transformation, social transformation, purpose finding, creativity, accountability within a community. Every one of these things has been a part of the things that I've been describing that are happening across the Jewish community. And to the extent that Angie and Casper started in a very different place than I did and looked actually at least nominally at different programs and events than the ones that we're doing, it's a reminder that at some level we're all human beings and that the needs that we have for community and meaning are consonant over time. Um, and then a few last, a few other things. <clears throat> One is that the Jewish people didn't enter human history in a synagogue, a JCC. Jewish tradition comes alive outdoors. We entered, it's not how we think of ourselves if we grew up in Manchester or Manhattan, but we entered human history as an indigenous people with a relationship to land, language, life cycle, climate, and fundamentally that's what the Torah is. We've traveled through all these centuries and all these countries and all these languages, but it's the same Torah taken out in the most extreme ultra-Orthodox synagogue and the most liberal reform synagogue. It comes alive when you take it outdoors. Um, secondly, the, 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 this work needs to be grounded in text. That's certainly true in the Jewish community, but I suspect it may be true across religious traditions. That it's not just about engaging with the world, but it's actually engaging deeply and, and, and thoughtfully with our own tradition. Um, the particular and the universal. I think when I was founding Chazan, there were certain things that I did then that were obvious to me. But now, 16 years later, I understand that certain things, in a sense, were critical and necessary. Chazan is, on the one hand, very particularistically Jewish. It's rooted in Jewish tradition. It's largely focused on the Jewish community. And yet it is explicitly trying to create a healthier and a more sustainable world for everybody. And people come to our programs or are involved in our work and work for, for the organization across all religious backgrounds or, and none. And the ability to be able to frame both the particular and the universal is, I think, incredibly important. Um, a needed symbiosis between innovation and legacy institutions. There is a huge amount of creativity in the American Jewish community at the moment, and some of us got a certain kind of brownie points for being social entrepreneurs with the presumption that we were chucking rocks at the organized Jewish community. And I stopped getting invited to those panels because I was so radically off message. And I don't feel any sense of hostility whatsoever to the mainstream Jewish community. I'm proud of it. I'm part of it. And the changes that are happening are happening by building relationships between innovation and change and existing legacy institutions. Um, <clears throat> and just this thing about going outside. Ooh. Oh, you know what? Oh. <laughs> it's OK. It is okay. We, at this point, we're in the home stretch. There are two versions of this PowerPoint, and when we came back from the video, we went into the other one. Uh, so that's okay. There were some other key bullets, the most vital thing in the whole world that we're going to lose now because we've forgotten. So forget that. And, and one of them was that I changed this slide. 
Because I wanted to talk about challenges, and I didn't want the first word there to be money. This is like <laughs> the penultimate version of it, but okay, we'll go with whatever's here. Um, money is a challenge. If we're trying to change the world, there are many, many, many things that don't need money. Not everything is about money, but the process of actually building resources for needing change is incredibly painful, and there is no magic bullet, and it's a, it's a, it's, there, there are great, great things happening within and beyond the Jewish community, but if there were people who wanted to fund these things on a larger scale, there are amazing things that we could do. Um, the new arising within the old, having talked about the value of bringing these things together, it also creates challenges. Professional pathways. We're starting to think a lot about how do we create careers for people in the Jaffe field. It's not totally straightforward. There are a growing number of Jewish 20-somethings who are having these incredible experiences and are finding themselves as farm managers in Jewish summer camps, which is not a role that existed as recently as three or four years ago. And then what happens next? Um, the challenge of impact and evaluation. Um, we actually quite consciously are trying to do a lot of different things in this work. We're trying to touch people's lives right now, here and now in this one experience. And we're trying to drive societal change. And ultimately, we're trying to have impact years and decades and ultimately centuries down the line. And how do we measure those different things? Um, what is the nature of the relationship between renewing a faith community and striving to have impact in the wider world? That's a key question because I really genuinely, when I say Chazan's about trying to create a healthier and a more sustainable Jewish community and a healthier and a more sustainable world for everybody, I really genuinely mean both pieces of that. I understand that we have stakeholders who could disaggregate it and who care more about one than the other, but I really genuinely don't disaggregate it. I really genuinely care about both. But what are the, if the two things are in tension, how does, what does one do about that? I think at the end of the day, the first 10 or 15 years of the Jaffe movement has had almost certainly a bigger impact within the Jewish community than in changing the farm bill or changing food systems in this country or food deserts or poverty or a whole series of other things. And what do we do about that? Um, and the last challenge is something about despair and being overwhelmed, right? That, that, that to engage with these things is actually to choose to look at the world. And it's a complicated moment right now. And holding ourselves through that process is actually really difficult. Um, opportunities. I changed the order of this as well. This is not really in the right order, but I think there's a real opportunity to create interfaith and multi-faith CSAs. I think it's just an easy thing to do across the country. If anybody here is engaged with a religious institution that's near a synagogue and you're interested in thinking about whether it would be possible to do a joint CSA, come and talk to us. And I think interfaith and multi-faith programming generally. I think that Teva is a really fascinating model. This notion of doing immersive religious environmental education for middle school kids, right? That could be done in the Sikh community. It could be done in the Muslim community. It could be done with evangelicals. Um, and similarly, Adama, right? We've had um, the Wake Forest Div School, Fred Barnson, um, has been bringing up um, students there fairly strong liberal Christians from Wake Forest Div School to come and do a week of Adama. It's a model that we think could be applied in other communities. Um, that's the text I was going to do, but we don't have time. Um, we're starting to do a lot. We're going to do a lot more work in the next seven years um, in relationship to um, farm animals uh, and industrial uh, food production in this country. That's the Chazan seal of sustainability that we're developing to try and drive more systemic change in institutions. I'm not going to. I'm going to skip forward. This is. I want to. And this is. This was just a side to to sort of show how some of these um, things overlap. I, I want to just end with this. <laughs> Um, this is um, Reb Simcha Bunim of Pshiska, um, an early 19th century Hasidic Rebbe. Um, and he said something which, which I've thought about for a long time, and the longer that I've been doing this work, and particularly recently, has really, really, really been speaking to me. And he said, each of us should have two pockets, and in our pockets we should have two pieces of paper, and one of them, it should say, for my sake, the world was created. And the other one says, I'm dust and will return to dust. And the reason that it so deeply speaks to me is the first one is essentially saying, each one of us is profoundly impactful. Each one of us is absolutely capable of making a difference in the world. And at the same time, like, who am I? I'm just a speck of dust. I'm going to have no impact. But I'm profoundly significant. But I'm not having any impact. 
And, and the ability somehow, we often each are pulled to one of these, but the ability to strive to hold both seems to me an important piece about this work. Um, so now I hope that you can see this photograph, um, which we saw at the, at the start a little bit more in, in context, and start to understand what it is outside a JCC building in Manhattan on 76th Street to have Jewish farmers there who are selling produce in public space and engaging both with the Jewish community and the wider community in a way to signal that the nature of Jewishness is both ancient and traditional and is renewing itself in our days in new times. As Reb Shlomo Kalbach might have said, I bless you and me and all of us that we live well and learn well um, that we connect both to the physical world and to the traditions that sustain us uh, and nurture us, and that we thus genuinely play some role in genuinely creating a healthier and a more sustainable world for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess we're going to take, turn to your neighbor, quick question. We're going to do two really quick questions, then we're going to end at 10 o'clock. But just turn to your neighbor. If you had one question, what would it be? Okay, and come back together. Shh. Shh. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take three questions, and, and I'm going to try and do that, and then we're going to finish here. Yeah, tell us your name and your question. Sorry. Okay. So um, uh, you talked about grounding these agricultural programs in your faith. And I feel that this is a big challenge for us all. You also talked about um, interfaith CSAs and a few other interfaith things. And the functional word there is faith. It's bringing faith into our food system, bringing faith into our uh, all other systems, our daily life in a certain way. So what the challenge that we're, f we're experiencing in our community, which is not a traditional religious community, but a spiritual community, is that with every spiritual <coughs> discipline, there's a certain, you, all, you can almost call it dogma, okay? There's that structure. It's the... Um, the text, grounding it in text. And there's a challenge that we experience in linking those two things. It's, there are people who say, well, you're just using agriculture as an excuse for talking about your, you know, your text, your, all of those things, your dogma. And I guess the superficial answer to that is, in order to avoid that happening, is saying, is doing it better, making those connections in a deeper, more profound way. But I'd love to hear your reflections on that, on linking those in a way that makes it alive for a millennial. Thank you. I'm going to take two other very quick questions, then I'm going to try and answer all three of them in three minutes. Yeah, two other quick questions from anybody. Yeah. What yeah. you called it, thank you for the yeah. Um I was just wondering what the inspiration for that was. Yes. Very excited about that. Thank you. And a third one. Yeah. Are you doing organic or biodynamic in your work? Thank you. Without pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers that are yes. harmful to the environment. Yes, thank you. So, so I'm going to take the third question first because my answer to that is go to Jana's session this afternoon. And Jana, who's teaching a session on text, will also talk a little bit more about what's happening at the Adama farm. But I think the, the shortest answer, and you'll tell me if I'm wrong, is that I don't think we're certified organic, but we are. Oh, we are. We're certified organic. Who knew? Thank you. There you go. I didn't even know that. That's great. Um, the, the, 
the, the question about Jifa, right? Jifa is, 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 by the way, not a Chazan project, although, in fact, we're doing a lot of work on this topic at the moment. Jifa is an, in, an independent project that's just arisen, and it's essentially a partnership partly between us and um, some independent leaders in the Jewish community and the Humane Society of North America. Um, for 2,000 years, Jews have had a tradition of keeping kosher. Right, that photo of the pastrami and the locks in that slide. And the word kosher literally means fit. So for 2,000 years, the Jewish people have been saying, is this fit for me to eat? Well, we at home keep kosher in a traditional sense, right? Orthodox rabbis eat in my kitchen at home. So I observe, as it were, the rules of kashrut in a traditional sense. And that question, is this fit for me to eat in the 20th, 21st century, has a whole series of other questions that need to be addressed. And that's partly what GIFA is about and why it came out of the Jewish community. In relationship to, to, to dogma and faith and some of the things that you're getting to, I, I think that, 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 that it leads me something, actually, I guess a last word that I do want to say. Every religious tradition actually has a different relationship to its own dogma. It's one of the things that one can least... Uh, generalize about. Um, the process of engaging with intellectual integrity, with Jewish tradition, within a Jewish community, which is itself famously, as people know, two Jews, three opinions, right? And nowadays it's seven Jews, nine denominations. Um, the process of being able to hold difference is actually incredibly complicated and incredibly important. And I don't think there is a single perfect way to do that. But the the desire right at the start to be committed to inclusive community and to strive to respect people individually and the tradition that one comes from is, I think, key to that. And with that, it's 10 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nigel, for getting us started and for modeling a way to be deeply in a tradition and fully available uh, to the world. Thank you.